Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Today we're joined by two freshly funded CEOs who are leading companies in the intersection of connectivity, privacy, and transformation. Welcome on the stage, and you're seeing it here, Oishin. You got it, Oshin Hanrahan. Oshin, and <laughs> sorry about my Irish. <laughs> CEO of Keychain, a company building software that is helping revolutionize and simplify the complex world of supply chain management. He's also an angel investor and advises more than 50 companies, am I right? Okay. And Avery Panorum. Panorum? Yep. Cool. CEO of Tailscale, that some of you might know as the best VPN service for secure networks but others know him as a champion for several open source, uh, source projects. In the next 20 minutes, we'll be exploring how their software solutions can help connect industries and people across the globe and between traditional industries and emergency te uh, technologies. Thank you both. Um, let's start with the philosophical question. The name of this uh, session is called Mended by Code. What does that mean to you and in the context of your company's mission, both of you? Go for it. You want to go? All right. Well, uh, Tailscale is a connectivity framework or a, a mesh network or a network layer. And one of the things that we try to do with Tailscale is like connect things that were otherwise not connectable. And if you look at the, the, the internet as it is today, a lot of stuff is not connected anymore like it used to be even 20 or 30 years ago when everything used to have a direct connection to everything else. And so nowadays, you have to go up to the cloud and back. And so Tailscale is one of these things where we, we really focus on fixing really low-level details that some of us have even forgotten or broken in order to connect things that haven't been connected. About you? So we do something very different. We deal with the real world every single day. We think about all the products that you buy in a grocery store. So all the food, the beverage, the beauty, the household, the personal care, the supplements, all the things you buy every single day in a grocery store, they didn't start there. They started in someone's mind. Somebody said, we're gonna make a new product. We're gonna make a new soda, a new sparkling water, a new protein bar, a new juice, whatever it is. Somebody says, let's make a new product. And that kicks off this chain of events that historically has been a mess. So the process to go from, I wanna make a new product to you buying it in the grocery store is an absolute wreck. Mm -hmm. It takes 18 to 24 months. Somebody starts with this amazing idea for some super healthy drink, and by the time it gets to the grocery store, it's laden with all the things that we hate. It's got extra sugar, extra fat, extra salt. It's got preservatives and additives and all these things in it. And the reason for that, I don't think it's because people start wanting to do the wrong thing. It's because the process is so hard and so expensive that when people go through it, they end up de-risking the project. Mm -hmm. And every time you de-risk something in consumer, you make it a little less healthy typically. You put a little more sugar, a little more fat, a little more salt in it. And at Keychain, what we do is we help brands and retailers make product faster. The innovation cycle for product has never been under as much strain as it is right now because we all live in a slightly different world than we did five or 10 years ago. And as a result of that, there's an opportunity for us to build the operating system to help brands and retailers put product on our shelf. So that's search and discovery for manufacturers, it's AI product creation, it's an operating system for manufacturers to build their facility, and that's what Keychain is all about. It's helping put healthier product on our shelves so people, people can live a better life. How did you come up with the, with the supply chain chain of events? How did you? So I started with the name Keychain, and I thought we're gonna do something, no I didn't. So I've spent the last 15 years building uh, two-sided platforms. I built a company called Handy, Handy is the largest on-demand home service company, uh, on-demand uh, handyman and cleaners. I sold that business to Angie's List. Angie's is the largest home service company in the world. I was the CEO there. I ran it up to $15 billion of GMV, 7,000 people, 20,000 contractors. And when I left home services after a decade, I took a little break and I got together with my co-founder from Handy and we thought, let's build another real world company. Let's build another company that's focused on helping real people. In home services, you've obviously got huge exposure to people's homes, to real life. You're not operating in like an esoteric lair. And we wanted to build another real world company. And the more we got into CPG, the more we realized the impact that we could have on people's lives by helping them build better product. And below that, we started testing it and we realized the pull was there. So, when you, you know, as a founder, you're trying a lot of things. I think one of the skills that founders have is when they see lightning in a bottle, 
they're able to recognize it. So we recognized very quickly the pull that we had from the market, and that's led us to today we've got 20,000, we're, we're less than two years in, we've 20,000 brands and retailers that use the product, eight of the top 10 retailers in the United States use it, and they post about a billion and a half dollars a month of projects on Keychain. So it was the combo of prior experience and also recognizing the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, you, you advise 50 plus companies these days, is connection the common thread between all of that, uh, all of those worlds that you have inhabit? Look, I, I, there's, a, there's a few different things we look at. So I invest alongside my co-founder. There's a few things we look at. Uh, one is, do we understand the industry? Is it something we're aware of? The second is, do we think we can add value? So do we have a unique flavor, a unique edge, some insight that's different to everyone else? And the third is kind of what you're saying, I think, which is, is it a double impact business? Like, yes, mm -hmm. we want it to make money, but can it have a positive impact? Is it something that is is that a something force that is for good for in the world? And to us, you know, helping people take care of their homes is a force for good, helping people eat healthier product, maybe making the product a little more sustainable so it doesn't destroy the planet, also good for the world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to you, just in a few seconds, I'm just going to ask you a, uh, oh, well, another question. Oh wow, I'm really question. on the spot here. It's like rapid <laughs> fire. Because he's, uh, he's an angel investor too, and I'm sure a lot of people here also want to know about that. Uh, you just raised $68 million for a keychain. How does that compare to being an angel investor? Look, the second time around as a founder, it's totally different. So you're, in a, you're operating in a different environment, you're working with uh, a different capital structure than you had the first time. So it, it's really not comparable. The, the angel investments that we look at, you know, we write very small checks, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 um, dollars. And that is typically into either founders we know and understand, it is into areas that we know and understand, and typically, again, we have an edge. So we have like a, a, a different take on it. I think the, the capital that we've raised, one of the interesting things about the capital a second time is because you're very fortunate and able to be more, more uh, restrictive on the capital that you bring into the business, you can really use your cap table to drive the business forward. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time thinking about who we bring into the business. So we brought in General Mills, we brought in Hershey, Richest Foods, Schreiber. Here in Portugal, we're very fortunate to have the investment arm of the largest retailer in Portugal of Continente, Sonai. So Bright Pixel is an investor in Keychain, and they really do bring a perspective on the business that you're driving. So mm -hmm. it is you know, something that I think first time founders, where they can, they should do, they should use the cap table, not just to raise capital, that's like the base level, but how can they use the cap table to drive the business forward? Mm -hmm. You have a personal side for everything. Yeah. I, I see um, Keychain is also expanding to Dublin. Why Dublin? Was it a strategic or sentimental? Is it, is it because I'm from Dublin? Is that the question? Yeah. So <laughs> we're, we're fortunate. We, we have uh, our engineering team in India, um, mostly in India. We have our sales team, go-to-market partnership team out of Austin, Texas. We've got 50 people in India. We've 30 people in Texas. We have a small HQ team where we do product design and HQ out of New York. And we've recently opened our, uh, our European go-to-market out of Dublin. I'm obviously Irish, so it, it, you know, we, we definitely mm -hmm. have a, a little bit of a sentimental value there. But Dublin's a great place to build a multilingual go-to-market sales team. Uh, and we're super excited to expand into Europe. I think we announced Ireland, I think in the next, uh, in the next week, we'll have both another, um, another capital announcement and uh, an announcement about some other European countries we're expanding into. Now it's your turn, Avery. <laughs> All right. Uh, you build sales scale to solve a, pro a friend's problem, right? Uh, how did that become an industry shifting solution that you built in a week in a weekend? <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I'm I'm very much the opposite. We just talked a lot about physical world stuff. I'm a very like electrons and bits kind of person, which of course, in in a way, are the physical world, but it's a lot more abstract. Um, and I think the, the thing that ties these things together is that you know, even the work you're doing, all of those interconnections you're building nowadays are digital, right? Like we connect people on an online marketplace and how does the online marketplace work? Well, there's a network underneath that connects the different components of that online marketplace. How do people connect to the marketplace? They use a web browser and a phone and like bits are traveling through the air. Uh, all of that stuff nowadays is ha able to happen so much faster because everything is digitized. Mm -hmm. And so Tailscale really works in this like super low layer. It was originally created, our very, very first customer when we found it was a bank in Canada. And this bank had software that didn't support what's called two-factor authentication, right? 
if they, the software didn't handle this, you know, those codes you get, SMS on your phone or whatever that protects you against password phishing, and they needed that added. And so my proposal was, why don't you move all of those servers onto a network and make that network require two-factor authentication? And so we had to build the software for that, and we had to do it quickly because they had an audit coming up. So we helped them put this together, and that was the first version of Tailscale. It was like literally built in a weekend to let them do two-factor authentication to connect to their own servers on a network that was in another room. Mm -hmm. um, and it grew from there to being like a much more, uh, much more sort of advanced system. And now we now have millions of users and tens of thousands of customers. Um, but it all comes down to like the same underlying like, look, connection is connection. Why don't we make that part go away? Why don't we make the connection secure so that everybody else doesn't have to worry about security at every single step of the way? Mm -hmm. And you can see connections on Tailscale. You have a big fan base <laughs> of engineers and developers because you think about them first. Right. And, um, but uh, you launched in 2019 and then came COVID. Do you think timing is everything? Uh, timing was certainly really valuable for us. It's, I'm, you know, it, it's, I don't like to celebrate COVID exactly. Uh, I think we all had a pretty bad time of COVID, but also starting a company that turned out to be a invaluable. really valuable tool <laughs> for remote work right when suddenly everybody had to start learning how to remote work was very, very good timing for us. Uh, if we'd started it maybe a year earlier, we would have been a more mature company ready to grab onto some of the biggest like sales opportunities at that time. Uh, so now we're, we're sort of in the, we're in the phase where some three-year contracts that were signed in emergency situations uh, during COVID are starting to roll off. People are saying like, oh, I, I'm not actually as happy about that three-year contract as I thought I would be. Uh, maybe I'm going to investigate some alternatives. So we're, we're still seeing some of, the, some of the advantages of that, but we've built up a, a really nice product in the meantime. Some people know you because of your work with open source, You're kind of a champion of open source technology. Uh, why is open source so important to you? And how does it connect with people? Because that's the model of this conversation. Yeah, well, I, I've been doing open source for a very long time. Uh, I think I downloaded Linux on my dial-up modem uh, about a year after the project started. Um, and I was, I think, maybe 14 years old at the time. I didn't have an actual networking card, so I sent my dad to the store, and he's like, Avery, I can find really cheap networking cards at the junk store. Just tell me what you want. And I'm like, I don't know anything about networking. I just have two computers to connect together. Just get me two of the same thing, and then ask the guy what cable you need to connect those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came home, and the, the cards he bought, he said, Avery, you're going to be so happy. I got the biggest ones in the box. Uh, and I'm like, uh-oh, that's, that's not how computers work. <laughs> um, and so it turned out there were these cards from 1980 uh, that predated the existence of Ethernet, which is you know, the original <laughs> sort of widespread networking technology. This was called ArcNet. And so there was no Linux driver for these things. So I, I was able to look at the Linux source code, look at the instructions for these cards, which mercifully was like pretty simple because they were designed in 1980, and then make this work in Linux. And I could have never learned how to do any of that stuff if open source hadn't existed. And that's mm -hmm. like really valuable to me as a developer. Like it set my career. Eventually that became my, my second paying job. The first one was a computer store that hired me uh, because of my Linux skills. And the second one was a company still making ArcNet cards uh, like considerably later that needed to update them to the latest standards because car factories were still using them 30 mm -hmm. years after they were obsolete, right? And so it just like propelled my whole career forward. And it's the same with Tailscale. Tailscale is, as popular as it is because there's an open source version. People love it, people share it with their friends, it turns into word of mouth, and that's what leads to business. Mm -hmm. You actually use it, right? Or we are, I... we're, we're, we're a customer of Tailscale. Uh, I think we're, we're twice a customer. I think we were a customer um, back at Handy and Angie in the, the COVID era, and I were, we're a customer again now at, uh, at Keychain, very happy with the product. And it, it's funny you talk about timing. I, I think timing is like, one of these things that as founders we inherently feel, but like we don't talk a lot about the timing. And you know, there's different things that cause the timing shift. It's sometimes it's societal, so it, in, in Keychain it's how do people eat their food? Like what's driving them? Is it social media? Is it TikTok? Like what is driving them to change? And then there's political change, which we're obviously all aware of. And you know, I think the political environment of tariffs and the Maha movement has, wh wh whichever side of it you're on, has definitely created an environment where there's more and more opportunity in supply chain than ever before. The same way remote work created the, you know, the need for VPNs and remote work tools, there's so much focus right now 
on supply chain because of Maha, because of tariffs, that if you're investing in that area, if you've got opportunity, there's real potential to build platform and category defining companies mm -hmm. because of the shift to, uh, to a more volatile environment. Mm -hmm. uh, last question, because timing is everything and we only have two minutes now. <laughs> If you could redesign your industry tomorrow, where we would you start, both of you? Go for it. All right. Well, uh, I guess maybe I have, I have two hot takes related to that. One of them is the cloud is a little bit overblown. Everybody loves the cloud, but everything has evolved to now the cloud is a tax on every single bit of software that gets developed. And so I like to think of it as like if you're looking for the bottleneck in a system, the bottleneck of the system is who gets to charge the tax. And right now, Amazon gets to charge the tax on so any software you try to run, which is an uh, amazing accomplishment for Amazon. They're a great company. They've put themselves right exactly where they were needed. But they're only needed because we can't figure out how to just connect a computer to another computer without going to the cloud and back. Uh, and a second part of that is like AI. I think people should do more AI. I think people should think about the security of AI when they're connecting those things. I think there's, there's some mistakes that are being made there. There's like a great opportunity, but like there's also going to be some really big like messes made because people are not being cautious. So uh, the industry we're in starts with the consumer, in our eyes, starts when the consumer goes to the grocery store. Between that and the people that make the products, the farm, there are so many layers of retailers, distributors, resellers, manufacturers, ingredient providers, packaging providers, the layers that you, you, you think are there, it's like three or four times as many layers between you buying something and the food actually being produced or the people doing the work. And once upon a time, it might have made a lot of sense when we, you know, as a nation or as a society, we didn't have enough food. We're now in a world where we've got plenty of food. So we actually can spend the time and effort to get closer to the food closer to the producers to make the food healthier. So I think what we need to do, if I could redesign it, would be to strip layers out so that we are closer. It doesn't mean we're all going to go to the farm, but there definitely is an opportunity to take layers out. Whoa. What? Such. What? Can someone help us? Okay, it's done. To take layers out such that there are fewer layers and fewer abstractions between the people buying the food, consuming it, and the people actually making it. And mm -hmm. I think that would result in us having a healthier society. Mm -hmm. And a connected world. And that's why you're both here on this stage. Thank you very much. Uh, we could talk for hours about, uh, about this, but our time is up. 10 seconds. Thank you both for a fascination conversation. Conversation. <laughs> That's what happens when I'm trying to read. <laughs> thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. And thank you, thank you. for watching. Enjoy your website. Thank you, Danielle. Right. Bye, you. everybody.